Are you looking for ways to strengthen your marriage? Would you like to raise children you enjoy being around? Do you long for a peaceful, orderly home that's a blessing to everyone who comes through its doors? Then you've come to the right place. I'm Jennifer Flanders, a Bible-believing, homeschooling mother to 12 and host of the Loving Life at Home podcast. Join me as we discover what God's Word has to say about marriage, motherhood, and minding the things that matter most. Hello, friend. Welcome to episode 22 of Loving Life at Home. Our topic today is Christmas cards and letters. Don't you love all the extra mail the month of December normally brings with it? It's fun to open all the pretty Christmas cards and see the family photos, but I especially enjoy reading the newsy letters that are often included. Sending such newsy letters is one of our family's longest standing holiday traditions. We've been mailing an annual Flanders Family Update for 36 years now. I'm the one that usually puts pen to paper and drafts the letters. Some people don't realize this since I normally write it in third person, but the whole family is involved in the process. They make suggestions as to which stories need to be included each year. They don coordinating clothes and pose for family portraits to send out with our updates, and they help get all those letters ready for the mail. More on that later. And they also listen as my husband rereads all our old family Christmas letters aloud every December, one or two letters a night. We love to reminisce in this way. The anecdotes trigger all sorts of fond memories, which are in turn relived and discussed at length. This has been a great way for our younger children to learn the family history. It helps them to see their older siblings in a whole new light, and it cements into their hearts and minds stories of God's provision and watch care over our family through the years. So that's one of the reasons I write these letters in the first place. Not only do our annual Christmas updates help us keep in touch with distant family and friends, but they also provide an easy way to chronicle our family history and to share Christ and give testimony to God's faithfulness. That last point is something believers are commanded by scripture to do. Psalm 103.2 tells us, bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget his benefits. First Chronicles 16.12 says, Remember the wonders the Lord has done, his marvels and the judgments he has pronounced. Then Psalm 78, 4 reads, We will not hide them from our children, but will declare to the next generation the praises of the Lord and his might and the wonders he has performed. I'll include a link in the show notes, but do you remember all those amazing stories of God's provision I shared in episode 19? The reason I could easily recall most of those stories is because they were written down and recorded in our past Christmas letters. Interestingly, as our family grew, my reasons for writing our annual Christmas letters changed. I found myself writing not so much to inform, but to remember. Although I continued to share what I had written with our family and friends, I was really writing it for myself. The letters allowed me to freeze those moments in time that I wished never to forget. Significant milestones, everyday graces, hard-learned lessons, crazy mistakes, funny remarks. I wrote down all the things that made me smile or laugh or cry, the things I wanted to treasure in my heart and ponder for years to come. It was a subtle shift, really, but it elicited an unexpected response. This willingness to share our foibles, to laugh at ourselves, to be sincerely vulnerable, allowed others to connect with us in a way that a brag sheet could never do. I guess it made our family more real and more accessible because we began to get requests for extra copies of our newsletters. Never mind the fact that most of these letters were four pages long. People were passing them around the dinner table, forwarding them to friends, saving them in three ring binders. I had one friend tell me that her husband insisted on reading the entire thing aloud at his office party one Christmas. We even received postcards from complete strangers asking to be put on our mailing list. It was really bizarre, but it explains why when I decided to publish the first 25 years of Flanders Family Christmas Letters in a book to give our kids and grandkids, my husband urged me to make the copies available to people outside our family as well. Interested? I'll include a link in today's show notes. If you've ever thought about sending such a letter to your own friends and family at Christmas time, but you haven't known where to start, this podcast is for you. I'd like to share some helpful tips for writing your own Christmas letter, and I'll put a link in the show notes to a blog post I've written on that topic that includes samples so that you can pick a style that suits your family's personality and patterns so that you can follow any given example to create a letter that's all your own and stationary. Print out our papers to make it extra pretty and encouragement. 
Writing Christmas letters is one holiday tradition you'll be glad you adopted, and your kids will too. Of course, the style or pattern or stationery you use doesn't really matter in the long run. The important thing is just that you write something every year. If you'll do this consistently, before you know it, you'll have a detailed family history just like we do. The length of your letter may vary from a few phrases to a few pages. Some may feel too short, Others may feel too long, but keep trying, and like Goldilocks, you will eventually find a style that's just right and suits your family perfectly. My husband insisted I could save a lot of time by simply creating a fill-in-the-blank template, then shifting all our children's names up a space every year. This year, baby Blank joined the family. Blank learned how to ride a bike. Blank broke a bone or got stitches. Blank won the Best Competitor Award at the East Texas State Fair. Blank graduated from high school. Blank finished college and blank got married. While I admit that could be a great time saver, it would also be very monotonous and boring to read. So instead, I normally write a month-by-month Christmas letter. It's a pattern I've followed for 36 years now. I'll be posting this year's letter on our blog later this week, but I'll include a link in today's show notes in case you'd like to read samples of our Christmas letters from previous years. Basically, I just pin one paragraph for each month detailing the highlights of our year. Although I don't begin writing my letter in earnest until October, I'll occasionally jot notes to myself about funny stories or significant events that I want to be sure to include as they happen. I keep all those notes in a single file in Evernote on my phone, and I add to it as the year progresses. But sometimes I make it all the way to October, and that Evernote file is still empty. In that case, I just look over my daily calendar for the past 12 months and browse through all the photos I've taken on my phone during that same time. Both those practices are a great way to jog your memory when the time comes to write about what your family has been up to for the past year. Since I pack a lot of information into our annual updates, they are consistently four pages long. Keep in mind that I'm writing about a lot of people, though. Two parents, 12 children, five daughters-in-law, plus 20 grandkids that often warrant at least a mention. If your family is much smaller, your letter will probably be much shorter. I print our letters on plain white copy paper, two-sided sheets, and mail them in embellished envelopes. More on that in a minute. These days, I usually order Christmas cards with photos printed on both sides, a shot of our whole family on the front, and individual photos of each of our married children with their families on the back, plus one of mom and dad with the kids who are still single and or are living at home. But... When we first started sending our annual updates, I just used self-sealing business envelopes along with a 4 by 6 copy of our most recent family photo, which I would order through Snapfish for a penny a piece, or sometimes they even offer 100 prints for free. All you have to do is pay the postage. Since we usually mail our Christmas letters over the Thanksgiving weekend, my month-by-month account normally runs from December of the previous year through November of the current year, rather than January through December. Here's a sample month from last year year's update. Most of our grandkids joined us for our annual trek to San Antonio last December. In addition to making many sweet memories together, Jennifer got a refresher on the importance of staying alert to one's surroundings when she found herself alone in an elevator with a big burly dude built like a linebacker. He seemed friendly enough as they made small talk, but she grew increasingly nervous when he stepped off the elevator behind her and followed her to the far end of the hallway. There, still chattering away, she fumbled with her key and found that it had quit working. Mm, the linebacker hesitated, perplexed. I think that's my room. And so it was. Jennifer had accidentally gotten off on the wrong floor. Well, he laughed good-naturedly once she explained her mistake, clearly relieved to learn that he wasn't being stalked by some crazy lady. Thanks for seeing me safely to my door. If trying to arrange the year's memories in chronological order, month by month, is too much to ask or stresses you out, no worries. I have several simpler ideas that you can try. The first is a person-by-person Christmas letter. Devote one paragraph to each member of the family and describe the highlights of the year from that person's perspectives. If your children are old enough, you might even ask each of them to pin their own paragraph, then string them all together to make your family's annual update. Or you might try a Christmas-themed acrostic update. This is the pattern my sister has always followed, and I love it. She's a school teacher, so her acrostic spells Christmas, 
and usually has an overarching theme with an introductory C paragraph and a closing S paragraph. And each paragraph starts with one of the letters in Christmas, and it's spelt Christmas vertically down the edge of the page. You can easily adapt that acrostic pattern to suit your own style and even change the vertical word to something besides Christmas if you'd prefer. It's short and to the point, but it packs a lot of information into those few paragraphs. If you'd like to see a sample of what her letter looks like or any of the other patterns that I'm mentioning, I'll include a link in today's show notes where you can compare all the different styles and even download free printable stationery for making your own acrostic update. Another idea would be to write a Christmas letter in the form of a multiple choice quiz. Of all the Christmas letters our family gets every year, one of our favorites to read is from some friends who structure their letters like a pop quiz. It's 4 a.m. and somebody is screaming, is it A, the baby who still hasn't learned to sleep through the night, or B, Mom and Dad, who were rudely awakened when a pipe unexpectedly burst upstairs and dumped multiple gallons of cold water on them in their sleep. Or C, Bo, who woke up in the night for a drink of water and saw what looked like an alien standing on top of the barn peering through her window. Or D, Rebecca, whose pet squirrel, the one she's been feeding every two hours around the clock, just broke her heart by dying in her arms. Would you believe God sent a replacement within 24 hours? Each paragraph details what's going on at a different time of day. It's 8 a.m. and somebody is rushing out the door. It's 10 a.m. and someone is dancing for joy. It's 12 p.m. and somebody's feeling nervous. And so it continues front and back of a double-sided print on red or green colored paper. And the answer key is always the same. All of the above. I've included a sample done in that style in the aforementioned link, so check today's show notes if you're interested. And the simplest of all, you might want to try a bullet point list. We have a few friends who are able to pack a whole year's worth of news into a handful of bullet points. Their updates are so brief, in fact, that they fit on the back of a postcard, which also can save on postage. If you plan to mail this kind of Christmas card in an envelope, you can include more photos on the reverse along with your brief update, or you can choose a two-text box layout and leave the right side blank for the address if you want to mail them as postcards. However you choose to do it, I do hope you'll make sending annual updates a part of your family's routine. But don't feel like you have to send them out before Christmas. We have friends that send their yearly updates before Thanksgiving and others whose updates don't roll in until New Year's or Valentine's or even Easter. The important thing is that you take time to write down your family's history when and with whom you share it once it's written is entirely up to you. And for a fun way to put it all together once you're through, check out our ideas for staging a Christmas card assembly line. Our kids look forward to doing this every year. We send out a lot of Christmas cards and getting them ready to mail is a joint effort. So we set up shop at a long table and churn them out in fast order. Every member of the family is given a task. As our family has grown, we've had to manufacture extra, quote, jobs for the assembly line so that even the youngest members can take part. Most of our little ones are now in charge of stamps and stickers. One will put large stickers on the back of the envelope. Another will put small stars on the front. One will use a rubber stamp with red ink. Another will use a different stamp with green ink, and yet another will use a tiny self-inking stamp that says Merry Christmas. We usually listen to Christmas music while we work, and we have hot cocoa once we're done. And even our college kids still love to help and ask us to assemble on the night that they can participate, usually over Thanksgiving break. This year, we were about two weeks later than usual getting our cards in the mail due to an unforeseen delay at the printers with our Christmas cards. And our assembly line didn't have quite as many participants as normal thanks to the fact that a couple of our kids were sick at the time and my husband banned them from handling the letters that we'd be sending to family and friends so that we didn't unwittingly pass along any nasty germs or viruses with our annual updates. Several years ago, I smiled to hear one of my children say emphatically, it's a good thing we have so many helpers in this family. Can you imagine how long it would take one person to do all of this alone? He was too young to know then that there was once a time over 35 years ago when mom did the job completely by herself, minus the stars and stickers and stamping, I stuffed and addressed all the envelopes by hand and sent them unembellished. But the task is a lot more fun now that we do it all together. So here's how our assembly line uh, job assignments are currently broken down. One person will put the return address labels on the envelopes. Another will affix postage stamps to the envelopes. One will emboss the flap with a monogram seal. 
One puts small stickers on the front of the envelope. Another one puts a large sticker on the back. Again, we have rubber stamps in red ink or green ink. We use self-inking stamps. We have uh, foil stickers that we put on the envelope. One person will add a strip or two of washi tape on the front of the envelope. We'll put labels on the backs of photos. Back when we were just sending photos and not Christmas cards, we would list everybody's name and their age that year and stick that sticker on the back so that people would know who they were looking at left to right. I'd write them not in the order of age, but in how they appeared in the photo. And then another person's in charge of folding the Christmas letters and stuffing the letters and the photos into the envelope and then addressing the envelopes. Now I print out all the recipients' addresses so that I don't have to do that by hand. And then I'm usually the one that adds a handwritten note to the envelope. And then we seal it and often we'll use self-sealers so nobody gets stuck licking 200 plus envelopes and place the finished letter in a mail bucket. We'll rotate jobs several times during the course of the evening and we always pray for the recipients when we drop off the letters to the post office. Our Christmas card assembly line is still one of my family's favorite traditions. Like I said, our adult children often plan their visits home to coincide with this annual envelope stuffing event, bringing the grandkids with them who also want to help so our envelopes just keep getting more and more elaborately decorated with every passing year. So that wraps up today's podcast. To summarize, we send Christmas letters every year for three main reasons. One, to chronicle our family's history. Two, to keep in touch with distant family and friends. And three, to share Christ and give testimony to God's faithfulness. I hope you will consider doing the same. Thanks so much for listening today. If you have a question you'd like to hear covered on this podcast, message me on Instagram at Flanders underscore family or contact me through my website, lovinglifeathome.com. Before you go, if you've been encouraged by something you've heard on the show, do me a favor and forward the link to a friend or head over to Loving Life at Home on Apple iTunes to subscribe and leave a written review of the show. Your doing so will help others find me so they can listen too. Until next time, I pray the Lord will bless your efforts to build a loving home life centered on Him.